G'day, my name is John Lakey. We're at Sunbury, or just between Sunbury and Gisborne in Victoria. My father was a soldier settler here in 1949, and he was a mixed farmer running cattle, sheep, lambs, or for, uh, for wool over the last 70 odd years. A lot of this country has uh, remnant, there was occasional remnant of eucalypt, eucalyptus on it, but most of everything else would have been uh, wattle trees that are short-lived, that tend to grow and fall over. We started an extensive tree planting program in the, in the late 70s, the early 80s, and probably put in about 40 or 50,000 trees in that time. And then as you can see from the belt behind me, we were burned out in 2014 for the second time, also 30 years earlier. And the tree, trees have regenerated in massive numbers inside the wind belt, the shelter belts. And so we've got a mixture of species now, I'm a bit rusty on them, but things like uh, eucalyptus maleodora, peppermint, sugar gums, black wattles, silver wattles, black woods, a couple of calistamins, some malaleucas, uh, and then we're really scratching the barrel to find endemic species beyond that. At this farm, it's not such an issue because we're on the periphery of, of the, uh, the spread of, of serrated tussock, but you can see they still get around. The ones that pop up in the, uh, in the shoulder belts, we're hoping that they'll catch seed, and I'm certainly seeing that at other farms. So they'll stop the spread of the seeds, and they'll actually fall in a dry area underneath the shoulder belts, and they'll compost there because the shoulder belts take all the water. And even if the seeds, if they germinate, they still won't be able to produce seed. What we've tried to do over the last few years is try and reduce the amount of bare ground, so reduce the opportunity for to, to germinate. Keep active grazing cover has been the biggest push. I've had a crack at, uh, at some fodder crops through summer and the rationale there is to try and keep some green active roots in the soil. What I've also done there is plant 20 metre wide windbreaks with four different tree species in there and it's the, the lower tree species like uh, the acacias and the shrubby ones that really act as a, a sieve and they just trap any serrated tussock that blows in the wind gets trapped under them. We benefited from some very generous funding from Grow West, Helena Lindorf and her, her mop and also a little bit of money from Melbourne Water to revegetate stream, uh, stream sites. My windbreaks are actually uh, wildlife corridors, they had to be a minimum of 20 metres wide whereas here I'll tend to make them 11, 10 to 11 metres wide um, and hopefully they'll, they'll get maybe get a better benefit more quickly but even so, the, the density of trees has actually thickened them up now. And I discovered a bird's nest in one of my uh, eucalypts in a windbreak over there not, not recently. So they're already moving in. But the idea with the tree species was try and select things that would actually benefit local e ecological systems. And the rationale, without knowing a lot of detail myself, was to try and build systems up so they'd have some resistance to invading weeds like, like serrated tussock. I, I picked up ridges and I picked up existing substantial old trees and put those in the windbreak. So in some of my windbreaks, they have four or five different direction changes, but they pick up like those Indians riding along the ridges. They pick up all the ridges, and then hopefully down the track, if I can improve the soils and get a bit more grass growth there, I'll break those paddocks up. In fact, we're thinking very seriously about planting fodder trees on rip marks 10 metres wide that grow endemically, and it's just not Tagasaski, which likes doesn't like heavy clays, but look around for a whole lot of native trees that I know, and you can see the grazing pressure underneath here, and these sheep have only been goats have been in there for a week or a couple of weeks and look at what native trees that will grow naturally can I, I can use as a fodder any fire any windbreak sorry that lead to infrastructure you've got to be very careful a flammable infrastructure like yards or shearing sheds or hay sheds you have to be a little bit careful and maybe set them back 20 or 30 meters that'd be uh, don't put trees in the middle of your yards that sort of thing could just be a way of conducting a fire straight into your shearing shed or machinery shed right the design of the, the shelter belt is pretty simple it's one we picked up in the 80s it has a, um, a couple a tall species through the middle so you might start off with a shrubby calistamin or a small grevillea, a grevillea or an acacia we're elder here behind us over my shoulder then a taller tree so we've got some sugar gums here some maleodora and then black wattle moon's eye would be the medium height tree and then behind that in front of that again so you've got your tall shrubby species tall eucalypt smaller acacia and on the other side would be a smaller grevillea or acacia or calistamin a smaller shrubby tree and the idea for that is that to get the wind to come hit the small tree go up and go filtered through the foliage of the tree above so the difference between that and a lot of our traditional windbreaks is the windbreaks will stop the wind and then the wind then goes up into the air and you get turbulence forming three or four times away from the windbreak so you don't get the same windbreak effect as you would from a filtering windbreak and anyone that stood on a side I've seen um, single row casuarinas or even uh, olive trees used as windbreaks uh, and uh, beside the windbreak the, the wind just whispers through and the other side you couldn't light a cigarette right a bit on the on the good side you're fine this what we've done here most of our wind uh, will, wind will come out of either the, the northwest and southwest in that folio 
So we'll tend to direct windbreaks east-west and that also suits our farm because here the subdivision went north-south and all the fencing is east-west or north-south. Establish the windbreaks, we'll work out where we're going to put the trees, probably put a few strainer posts in and get some lines and then we'll, we'll rip those, the planting lines. Uh, I haven't done any amelioration in the plant but what we've done this year is if it's a wet spring I'll plant beside the rip marks, if it looks like being a dry summer I'll plant in the rip marks and that depends on the topography and this year we used a felt mat around the base of the trees and then a, uh, a simple two litre milk carton with a couple of uh, um, uh, canes to knock them into the ground and hold them there. This is, this is probably really your guarding from rabbits. If you don't have a rabbit problem you could just probably put them in the ground with the felt and the felt will just reduce uh, growth around the tree. Um, when I put them in, I was in August, I was quite late and I've got some 400, 800 metres of new trees have gone in up a, a couple of hundred metres away from us. Um, and I used the felt then and I think I'd probably do that by preference now. Right? And if I need to, I can come back and herbicide around if I get a lot of summer rain or an invasive grass. Use a, um, a contact herbicide and a residual herbicide to try and stop grasses regrowing in there. And you need, the guys were very concerned, to try and leave it enough six, seven weeks for that to not affect the trees. We try and rip in the middle of summer too when the soils are dry and try and get a bit of sh shattering as well. But we run into a lot of rock here, so we have to compromise all the time. Done here is I've ripped fairly shallowly. It's on fairly stony soil. And then we've tried to plant endemic native species. And I'm, when we go through the windbreaks, I tend to try and match each of the trees to the shallower stony soils. We'll get things like aloe casuarinas or this Acacia paradoxa. Some of the gums I'll pick out to go on the stony soils or the banks here down here. And then on the wetter parts of the soil, because you're getting the larval flows, so you're getting a ridge, then a deeper soil, then a ridge again. So you keep getting these shallow, then deep soils. And things like the hakeas and the wattles, well, they're pretty tough. They can go anywhere. A hakea is going to some of the deeper soils. So the, all the species are endemic. And it's hoped what we'll do is replicate the success in some of the other windbreaks where Ian's project found a hell of a lot of predator mites living in the, in the trees, overwintering in the trees. Thinking one of the problems I had last year was trying to get pastures and fodder crops to establish. And some of that could be connected to the absence of predator mites red-legged earth mites going to town. So long term we want a windbreak but also a habitat zone. It's not just a habitat zone but as we've said earlier it filters and catches travelling seeds, uh, weed seeds and that could be a raft of things especially serrated tussock which is designed to blow really well in the winds but it would take three or four years I think for these trees to reach each other and provide a barrier at ground level to block the, the spread of the tussocks. Uh, again we're fortunate here these are open paddocks and I can identify artichoke thistles and serrated tussocks and remove them as I see them. Mm -hmm.